You forgot the first rule of remakes, Jill. Don't fuck with the original. Merry Christmas, everyone! Merry Christmas! This is another episode of Don't F with the Original. With Nicholas, I am the VM correspondent for Idiomatic. And I'm Dimitri, editor in chief of Idiomatic.com and movie critic. Now, we were actually supposed to talk about um, The Hunt for Red October. Yeah. Because um, Jack Ryan's Shadow Recruit was slated to come out today. Yeah. But they pushed it back to uh, January 17th, so that's when we'll post that episode. I think it's a good choice. It's a weird Christmas movie, I think. A lot of times when they release it on Christmas, it's because it's either Oscar bait or crap. Oh, I see. <laughs> and since Jack Ryan's Shadow Recruit is not Oscar bait, I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> maybe it's not as crap as they thought, is what you're thinking? Yeah, exactly. Okay, interesting. So, maybe that's the case. So, you know... I was like, oh no, what are we going to talk about uh, uh, today in that case? Because, you know, there's like, uh, I don't believe there's a movie called 46 Ronin that we can review. Mm. Um, but, and then I was at Walmart and I saw in like the bargain bin, a movie called A Christmas Story Part 2. 1983 is the original A Christmas Story by Bob Clark. Wow. So I was like, what the heck is that? And so I found out that it actually just came out last year, 2012, a Christmas movie. And I thought like, you know what? Since there was a sequel about it, slash revival at this point, you know, it's like 30 years later. Let's talk about the original. Let's talk about Bob Clark's Christmas Story, a movie that everyone loves. Not me. Why do you hate Christmas? Well, the story is that Ralphie wa really wants a BB gun for Christmas. Um, so he tries to, you know, give the hints to his family that he wants a BB gun, and he's like, no, you're going to shoot your eye out. So then he plots, maybe, you know, in school, maybe when he writes his essay of what I want for Christmas, maybe he'll write it so good that his teacher is going to tell his parents. And again, no. Then he's, maybe I'll get Santa to give me one. And Santa is like, no, no BB gun, because it's dangerous. You should try out. And then towards the end, well... Well, no, let's not spoil the end. There. We, well, we can save it for the... Spoiler. Towards the end, Christmas happens. Yeah. And, you know, to be continued. Yeah, that's a pretty adequate synopsis for a film that's very hard to summarize. Yeah. Because uh, what it is, it's a slice of life movie. It, really what it is, is like, it's a couple of days before Christmas all the way to Christmas and stuff happens. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. Uh, and one thing that we should mention, though, it takes place around 1939, 1940. So it's a period piece as well. Okay, I was wondering why they weren't watching TV. Yeah. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I got that. It was... <laughs> Uh, and, you know, you can tell it's based on a series of short stories because it's really non-sequitur. Like, just random stuff happens all the way to that Christmas. That makes... Now that you tell me this, that actually makes sense. Because, hey, it was a bunch of random stuff. And some of it, you know, it, it felt like there was very, very long setups for, like, okay, a little, little payoff there. And I didn't quite like it. If just for that, it's like, no, the, the setup is, like, way too long. And, okay, I, I see where you're going now, but, it, you know, it, it's too late. <laughs> you know, I, I got the joke like 10 minutes before you did it. <laughs> well, what I like about this movie is that it's a very cynical Christmas movie. Everybody loves it, uh, and I am of these people too. And it does have a hopeful spirit about it because it, it is about looking back on your youth and, and seeing beauty in a lot of those things. But it is about seeing beauty in disappointment. The whole entire movie is about these characters facing one disappointment after the other. Okay. They get their spirits lifted up and then something happens. Like my favorite one is the Ovaltine joke because they, he listens to a radio show yeah. and he sends in his proofs of purchase by buying Ovaltine and gets the decoder. And at the end of the radio show, which is an adventure show, they give a code and using the decoder you can get the secret message. And because he's a kid, he's mm. super excited about it. Mm. And then the message turns out to be so effing lame. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what it is. Like, that's what life is. That's what youth is. It's just a series of disappointments because your imagination is so much wilder than the reality. And you're all constantly hit with the reality. Yeah. And that's what the movie shows us. And that that's the beauty of youth. Because as an adult, you look back on it. And what you remember is the sense of wonderment, not the pepper that follows it. Really? Because I do remember all the terrible games that I, I rented at, you know, the video store that I was like, I was really, really excited. I was like, oh, it's going to be a great game. And then you're like, dud. 
I remember playing Ghostbusters. <laughs> well, like, no, but like if you had kids, yeah, would you celebrate Christmas with them? Probably. Yeah. When objectively speaking, how many of your Christmases were good, and how many of them involved getting sweaters you don't give a shit about? Oh, okay. I can see what you're, you know, I can see what you're getting. Yeah. I, yeah. You remember the good gifts? Like I can't really remember the, the bad stuff. Yeah. I do remember getting some bad stuff, not specifically, but, you know, my mother layered it with the good stuff. So, you know, it was mostly, you know... But the thing is, we associate Christmas not just with the gift you did receive or yeah. didn't receive, but the, the feeling of anticipation and the dream of getting the most awesome gifts ever, even though you're not going to get them. I guess, yeah. You know, and, and that's what it is. That's, it's, it's, the, it's, it's sort of, with age comes the ability to persevere through disappointment and... Ralphie's youth, these few days before Christmas, is just one punch in the face after the other. Yeah. But it's cute. It's it's presented in a in a hopeful way. It's presented as like that's life and life is sort of magical that way. But yeah, it's a bunch of hits in the face. The dad loves turkey. That's one of the main things you learn about him. Yeah. Does he get turkey at the end? You bet your ass he don't. He got the way at the end there. <laughs> <laughs> There are certain parts I really like. The one I liked is when he, he, they, he gets like a really gaudy lamp. Yeah. And she puts it on and it's like they're about to leave the house and she just has to turn off the lamp. <laughs> it's like, why do you do that? To save electricity. And the rest of the light is completely lit up. It's just she turns off the lamp and save electricity. Okay. That, I did not see that one coming. I mean, I completely saw it was going to, that lamp was going, to, was going to get destroyed. The context of it is like the dad wins a lamp. Uh, it's random luck too. It's, it's random it's, luck, it's but random he, luck. he thinks it's going to be like the greatest prize ever. He thinks he's going to get a bowling alley, and they're like they're going to deliver a bowling alley to our house. It's like maybe, <laughs> and he's convinced himself that he's earned it. Yeah. it. It's the funniest thing, even though it's just luck. Yeah, and then when he gets it, he can't admit to himself that this is a piece of shit. Yeah, and he keeps putting all of his emotions onto it. And he holds it like the, the, it's the most precious thing in the world, even though you can see in the actor's performance mm -hmm. that at least part of him knows it's a piece of shit. Yeah. The fighter was a very good actor. Yeah, he's really good. Yeah, he, he played played the fighter really nicely. You know, he played crazy when he needed to sometimes <laughs> as well. Yeah, so yeah, it was good good performance from him. And again, that storyline is again about disappointment. The fact that he wanted a really awesome prize and didn't get one, and instead of expressing his disappointment, he's sort of twisting reality around to convince himself that that's a good prize, even though clearly it's not. Yeah. And that's the way he deals with this, with almost everything in life. He's a man who's very prone to denial. Indeed. You know? Yeah. And, uh, of course, the mother deals with things a lot more differently. She accepts things as they are, maybe to a fault, you know? The way she deals with her kid not eating is by letting him eat like a pig instead of enforcing proper eating manners. But it's just, that's the kind of woman she is. She just accepts things as they are. Yeah. Okay. Can you explain to me then, because I, I, that completely just flew you know, above my head I, while watching it. I just thought it was like supposed to be some sort of comedy that with very bad jokes that didn't work for me. Um, what was the deal with the, the bully subplot there? I mean... Well, the bully subplot, first of all, that's part of childhood. It's, yeah, it's, of course. Bullies are true. And again, it's about disappointment. His yeah. disappointment over getting a C- minus yeah. is so great that he, he, he gets so angry that he finally ends up doing something about the bully where okay. everybody else, and including himself, were just considering it a fact of life. All right. And his disappointment is so great that it allows him to move mountains to a certain degree. Okay. Or just a bully, but for a kid, that's a mountain. All right. And then when the mother shows up, which is a beautiful scene, she doesn't scold him for it. Yeah. And, that's, and it indicates two things. A, that she knows that the bully is a bully, and so she doesn't really have any pity for yeah, him. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. She's aware of what's going on in her kid's life, you know? Yeah. And the other part of it is that, if you think about it, she's aware of what's going on in her kid's life, but she's not doing anything about the bully. Yeah. You know? That is true. I guess she considers it a fact of life as well, you know. She considers it a fact of life, and again, she's a woman who accepts things as they are. That's how she is. She's almost immune to disappointment because yeah. she's just happy with whatever life gives her. But she was very proactive when he said a bad word, though, you know. She was like, who well, taught me to say that? And we'll then she called. Yeah. yeah. But that's because it's something she can change in her kid, whereas that's the bully is not something that she feels she can change. Okay, that's interesting. You know? The thing about it is like... She she's she's so understanding of him losing his crap over this bully. Yeah. And she just let it go. Like and it's a really sweet moment because she knows who her son is. She knows he's not 
prone to doing this. She knows that he must have been really upset about something. And yet she never bothers to ask what she was upset about, even though she knows. Yeah. And she's an interesting character. She's such an interesting character. Okay. With depth, like it's not a classic comedy character, like oh the doting mom or oh the quirky quirky mom or anything. Yeah. Like she's she's a complex character with a very weird approach to life, you know. Okay. And getting back to the soap thing, yeah. This is what I love about Christmas movie. You know, he said a bad word. They put my uh, soap in his mouth as uh, parents or were wont to do in the forties. Yeah. And but you know after he spits out the soap and he goes. Uh, I love the bit where she puts the soap in her mouth to see what it tastes like. That, that sheer human curiosity. That, to me, is why A Christmas Movie is one of my favorite movies. It's these little details that are just so human and so real and so adorable. It, it's such a random moment. And you, I don't know, you, you say you saw that coming? I didn't see that coming at all. That no, that one, that one I didn't see coming. Yeah. But it was just, I just thought it was weird, really. It was, you know... But you would do that. You would be curious. When you're like, you're making your kid do this, he clearly hates it. And you're like, what am I putting my kid through? When she does this, like, oh, that is horrible. <laughs> I guess. And the dad and his, his, his sort of know-it-all attitude and, and also very 30s, 40s attitude, you know, when he's repairing the car. Yeah. And, and uh, the mom says, like, go help your dad, you know? The kid shows up, and the dad's going, what the hell are you doing here, you know? Yeah. Because he wants to be left alone, because he wants to be the one to fix it. And the kid goes, like, my mom said, it was, it said I could help you. And the dad goes, like, oh, okay. And it's so typical of that period where the mother was the sole person responsible for raising the kids, and the father was just bringing home the bread and nothing else. Yeah. He's like, oh, your mother decided that you're of age to help me? I guess you're of age to help me. Like, he doesn't yeah. question it. You I know. know? Was he like eight or something? Yeah. Just like, wow. And when he tries to help him, don't do it that way, do it this way. And it's like, yeah, yeah, that's exactly how a dad would act, basically. It's like, yeah, no, just, I'll do it. Never mind. <laughs> no, it's, it's, these characters are so human, are so believable. I, you, that kid, Ralphie, is exactly how a kid is at that age. Especially a kid that's prone to, you know, daydreaming. Yeah. And his daydreams, I've had daydreams like this. The one where, uh, you know, he's blind and because of, of, of soap, poisoning. soap poisoning and that'll show them. I've had similar fantasies of kids like, oh yeah, and then I'll die and they'll cry in my funeral. Like, I've had those. Wow, you're, you're dark. <laughs> kids have those. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's, for me, it's such a touching movie because it captures human nature and mm. unfiltered. Okay. It doesn't try to dramatize it. It just presents it as it is. I, I guess it does. It's not something I guess I would have gone through. I was really expecting a comedy when going there because I don't know why I was expecting comedy because they were trying, to me, it felt like they were kind of trying to be funny, you know, especially when, you know, just random jokes that happen like that, like Fragile, it's probably from Italy. It's as fragile, you know, kind of, you know, so there was funny because it says so much about the father. That, again, the power of his denial. Yeah. There's like, it's going to be something amazing. He like, he knows it's written for agile, but his mind is so warped that he's going to yeah. read whatever the hell he wants to read. Yeah. So it's like, I saw it like a bunch of jokes at the beginning and it's like, well, this is, this isn't starting very funny. And it was like, kind of, you know, this point. And then again, I was expecting more like a comedy, like in the, Yes, in the modern sense, you know, but not not modern. I know how movies were like in the 80s, like comedies were not as, you know, as flashy as they are today, but I was still expecting, you know. Uh, I don't actually agree with that. Okay. I think comedies like this still exist today. Okay. But, but go on, go on. Yeah, I, it was like, you know, or maybe, again, because it's such a, f a famous movie, maybe the, the jokes have been just reused over and over again, you know. It's like when I saw, like, History of the World. So like that movie, I did not chuckle once because all the jokes I have heard, you know, elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, I, I've heard this before, you know, it's like it, it's been done. Maybe it, it had been, it's such a beloved movie and a movie that's so talked about and, you know, over and over again that it had been, you know, maybe overspoiled. For example, I know I had heard the, the Ovaltine joke before, you know, somewhere else. And it's like when it's like, you know, drink more Ovaltine. It's like, oh, okay, well, I've heard that. <laughs> You know, here's my thing. I mean, because you're talking about your expectations for the movie. Yeah. 
But at this end, and the fact that the movie didn't go according to your expectations, it yeah. turned out to be less of a slapstick comedy and more of a sort of slice of life type of movie. Yeah. But doesn't your mind adapt to what the movie is? Or do you just go like, not the movie I thought I was going to get? No, no, no. Or do you reach a point at some point during the runtime where you go like, oh, this is the movie I'm watching? No, I mean, I did start, you know, it did get a little funnier towards the end there. Yes, so I guess it, I did adapt. It's just, you know, overall, I guess, you know, I didn't enjoy the whole overall experience. I don't know, you know, even towards the end, you know, it was better than the beginning for me. But mm -hmm. it, it's not a movie I would like rewatch and say I did this is awesome. I have to rewatch this. It's just you know, I'm not unhappy. I saw it. You know, it was it was interesting, especially you know the ending. I really you know I like a lot. Uh, what part? The ending after the dogs okay. running the turkey. You know okay. that that was okay. kind of you know that was kind of fun. But you know the whole the whole journey at the beginning and you know him being in class and it was like it was like I was just like. Can you show me on the doll where uh, uh, Christmas touched you? Yeah. Well, for example, the whole tongue on the pipe thing, again, it was like, okay, well, it happened. The, the police and the firemen came for almost nothing. You just need to pour water on that for it to fix it. But, you know. Yeah. Uh, I just didn't get what's the point of that again. It's, I, there's a lot of scenes where that was like, okay. Oh, you mean what's the point of that? I mean, like, I don't a, understand you know, the question what the point of that is. I mean, I was not expecting this slice of life thing where, you know, very mostly detached stuff. So I was expecting, you know, okay, well, this, you know, this is going to lead to something somewhere else in the end, you know. I didn't get why they needed to get all the firemen and the policemen just to get that kid unstuck and then it goes nowhere afterwards it was yeah just, that storyline just ends yeah that was, that was just weird to me that you yeah, had just had the weird storyline that ended that you know was just okay they just start talking about you know a tongue in the pole and then he gets stuck and then that's it and you know I, I felt there was no payoff to that at all you're, you're sort of following the McKee formula essentially you know uh, you know like if, if you introduce an element in act one it has payoff in act three and whatnot and of yeah. course this movie doesn't do that and and I guess my question is like, don't you find it refreshing to see some a movie that does something different? Like we often talk about how, oh my God, we're tired of the superhero movies. Finally, something different. Yeah. Like here's a comedy that doesn't follow the the the, slap, the typical slapstick formula that yeah, does but... something different. And I feel like the criticism you're bringing up is that oh well, it doesn't follow the formula, so I can get into it. And no, that's, it's, that's intriguing. It's not really the formula. I mean. I go to movies to see stuff that's, you know, special that I don't see in real life. People living a slice of life, I can just live life and be that. I mean, it was just but, not, I don't know. But in that case, I, doesn't that argument come down to if it doesn't have a giant robot in it, I don't care? Like, I mean, well, like... Well, if, if not, maybe. Maybe it is. But if, if not, it's, you know, I would expect, you know, anything, you know, just have one thing pop out, out of the ordinary. That's when I, you know, towards the end when the stuff kind of got crazy, when he got like booted by Santa. Okay, I kind of got into that because that was kind of funny. You know, no, you know, okay, the Santa was kind of crumpy, but you know, it was like shit, seeing him like booted by Santa. That was funny. You know, that was unexpected. But you know, it's like to me that scene, for example, with the pole, is like the, the big weird payoff is that, you know, you have the, the police and the firemen show up for that. It's like, no, no, the big payoff is really that he gets his tongue stuck on the pole mm -hmm. and the kid, other kids abandon him. It, it shows how cruel even Ralphie and all the kids okay. are because kids are cruel. Oh, they just want to get punished though. Yeah, that's cruel. Your, mm -hmm. your, your friend is stuck to a fucking pole. <laughs> yeah. Who cares if you're punished or not? I guess, yeah. Um, I did think that. It is true. You know, <laughs> a bunch of assholes. <laughs> they but, are, they are. But, and that, that's yeah. sort of the point. Yeah. The fact that the cops show up, that's not a payoff. That's just them resolving and, and, and sweeping away the storyline to move on to something okay. else. The payoff is really the kids abandoning him. Oh, well, I guess, yeah. Maybe it, w it would have been different, you know, if they had just cut the scene and it's like, where is he? And then they go to somewhere else and, you know... He's in the bus, or he's walking home with like a thing on his tongue. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I feel that the scene where everybody comes to you know get him off the pole, I was like, well, extraneous. I didn't really need that. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, get him stuck on the pole. The kids, you know, oh, we're going to be late, and they get in. Okay, that was kind of amusing. And then you know him being pissed at his friends. You know, I can't believe you let me out there mm -hmm. or something. That would have been you know enough. I didn't see. I didn't need to have the teacher and it's like. Oh, I got away with it and stuff like that. It's like the, the, well, like the teacher really I, care, you know. I actually like that scene where she's like, "Don't you feel guilty, whoever it is?" 
and the the narrator reveals that no, he doesn't. He's a little shit. Like he was like, yeah, parents always used to say that, but it wasn't gonna work for me. Like he's such a jerk. Well, it seems to, it seems to me that she asked, "Aren't you guilty that you know you made him put his tongue yeah, in yeah, pole?" Yeah, yeah. Nobody made him do anything. He did it on his own. <laughs> hey, 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 the triple dog dared him, and that pretty much forced his hand. I guess this is the thing. I think um, the. The reason why I like this movie so much more than you do is because mm. I appreciate movies that uh, uh, aren't about fantasy, uh, whether it's realistic fantasy or not. And this is one such movie. This is a movie that where you're meant to recognize yourself and, and your youth and or other people's youth. Because, again, I didn't celebrate Christmas myself, uh, but I recognize human nature in it, our child's nature in it, and some of the stuff I thought as a kid, even though it was an exact same thing, Certainly not in the same period, because I'm not that old. I don't know, because I'm going to compare it to another movie about youth that I liked, which um, I hate saying the title in English, because it's so freaking stupid, but... The Dog Who Stopped the War. <laughs> yes. It, bad grammar in the title, that, that, that's the thing that uh, makes me laugh so much. It's the dog that stopped the war, people. Yeah. It's a that. It's not a who. You, you're not a dog owner, or else you wouldn't say that, Dimitri. <laughs> but... In those characters, you still recognize some of of yourself. You know, you have the like, you know, the big dumb guy, dumb guy that you know. He's like, what, what, what the hell are you talking about? And you have the little bossy guy, and yet they do something that's fun. They have like this giant snow snowball war which, with a giant fort, which you know? is where the fantasy enters. Yeah, but you know that I need that fantasy to be interested in that moment. You know, and I still enjoy those kid characters because you still recognize yourself in those characters. But I do enjoy the fantasy element of it. It's an interesting comparison. I like that comparison. Uh, mostly because it, I think it accentuates a little bit of the difference uh, between your viewpoint and mine. Because I feel that the characters and the dogs that stop the war... <laughs> Uh, for those of you who always speak French, by the way, the French name of the movie is La Guerre des Tuques. La Guerre des Tuques. That's right. Uh, War of the Tuques. I don't know why that would be so hard to just call that. War of the Tuques. It's tuque, cute. Tuque is not... A, I don't know. It's a word I don't hear often in English. Tuque. So, I don't know. The War of the Snow Hats. It's just... I don't know. <laughs> well, like, even if you don't want to use the hat part, yeah. like, just use any, any uh, winter apparel, like yeah. War of the Mittens. It doesn't matter. Yeah, that, that would have been perfect. You know? But, okay, so the dog who stopped the war... <laughs> I feel that the characters are broad caricatures. They're, they're, they have that one trait. Each kid has that one trait yeah. and nothing else. They're not characters. They're sort of archetypes. That's true. And in, in many ways, they're like a video game character. You recognize that one, tr that one thing that they do, that they do consistently throughout. But there was an Asian kid, Dimitri. <laughs> yeah, yeah, who was really good at math. Like, thank you for perpetuating that stereotype movie. Uh, but he was, it's a movie in the early 80s. It is what it is. I'm not that bothered by it. Yeah. Uh, but... <laughs> um, what was it? Yeah, but whereas I couldn't relate to them, I could identify what they were and, and think they're cute and fun, yeah. but I don't relate to them intimately the way I relate intimately to the characters in A Christmas Story, mm. uh, from Ralphie to the mom in particular to, to, to the dad. Uh, because they they have nuance, they have they have a way of thinking that affects all of their behaviors instead of having that one behavior that they repeat. Okay. Uh, and for me, that's more interesting. For me, that's more relatable. I think for me, that's 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 more work <laughs> than just saying like, yeah, he's good in math. Yeah. You know. Yeah, he had an annoying little brother that wanted to follow him around as well, which is which is what I related to him a lot. You know, yeah, he, yeah, he yeah. was me, and he, he's the architect of the giant four they built. So I was like, yeah, that guy's cool. And <laughs> of course, for many winters to follow, you know, I had to try and build that giant thing as well in my backyard. So it's like, I, I they went to the fantasy place, and I was like, you know, I want to go to that fantasy place too. You know, so that's that's why I like that movie a lot. It you know, it wanted me to get into that fantasy. Yeah. Whereas, you know, the other one is like, well, it's a, it's a normal Christmas. It's okay. You know, yeah, it's a normal Christmas. Yeah. That's what it is. It's, there's no fantastical elements. But again, that's part of the thing, though, because, again, it's all about getting screwed over. It's not about accomplishing this great thing. Mm -hmm. And then for some reason, the dog does something at the end. And then you have drama out of nowhere. It stops the war, Dimitri. <laughs> I, the final act of the dog who stopped the war is so effing insulting and manipulative and it's like i like three quarters of the movie then yeah. that thing happens and i'm like oh screw you movie <laughs> but that is, that is true <laughs> but um 
A Christmas Story never falls into that trap, which mm. is, first of all, a, a rarity in family films, to be honest. I guess, yeah. That third act drama, they, it never goes there. It's like, it's, it's just, it's, there's nothing dramatic that happens there. It's mm. just things that happen to everyone and that suck on the moment, but in the grand scheme of things, who cares, you know? I guess, yeah. It doesn't go into that fantasy, but keeps you sort of grounded in the, and invites you to appreciate your non-fantasy life. To appreciate your real life what it is is like look like ralphie's life is not that good it's not that bad but it's not that good it's a life he has cool gifts he has shitty clothes yeah. as a gift he he gets what he wants uh, at the end of the movie but then it backfires literally yeah <laughs> uh, you know like his life is that of a kid's life where it doesn't live up to his dreams but it's perfectly comfortable and nice and it invites you to look back on those years and, and go like, you know, that's what a life is and appreciate it and cherish it. And if you go into the fantasy, well, then you're cherishing the fantasy instead of cherishing the real life. This movie invites you to cherish real life. It's everyday stuff that we live through. And the movie says like, that's part of the fun of life. Like, certainly that's the conclusion of the movie by the time they go to their alternative for having turkey. Yeah. <laughs> which is... You know, that's not the Christmas anyone dreams of. But, you know, you look at the mom and she's having a grand old time. Oh, she she seemed traumatized and then laughing. So I don't know which one it was, though. It was like, well, I think it's kind of freaky, though, being served that way. <laughs> but she's laughing her head off, yeah. though. And again, it goes with her nature because she'll go with the punches. Although I'm not sure that was wanted or if it just, you know, the actors start giggling and it's like, oh, just go with it or something. I don't know. I don't know. It fits the character so well, though. That is true. Because she giggles about a lot of stuff. But she was traumatized when she saw the thing coming first. And then, you know, and then she starts giggling. And then when they, they, they cut it, she's traumatized again. So I, yeah. I'm not sure, you know. Well, like... she goes from, from Ugh, to ha ha ha. But it's because it's off-putting to her. But that makes her laugh even more. Okay. And that's, but, and that's real of life, too. It's sort of like those things that you're afraid of. They end up being some of your favorite memories. Because there are the memories where you end up doing something you've never done before. Okay. You know, and you are afraid of them, and at the same time, you find them joyful. That, that's and that's sort of what the movie is about. Yeah. Disappointment is a good thing. We're taught in movie culture, especially in fantasy movie culture, yeah. to sort of overcome the odds to get everything you want, and that's how life works. But look, sometimes love, life just punches you in the face, and you roll with it, and that's how it goes. And you can, well, to be fair, I mean, the dog. Who's what that what stopped the war? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there is, you know, like you said, the third act that came out of nowhere. You know, it's not like overcome the odd. I mean, something bad happens and they, they kind of deal with it as well. It's just the whole movie was not based on that, but you know, it's 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 not all super happy, you know. This yeah, is great. but it, it isn't about celebrating that unhappiness. Okay. It is about shoving a moral that had nothing to do with the rest of the movie That's a good in point. there. Yeah. They were like, and they come out. I was like, yeah, war was bad. It was like, it wasn't until <laughs> that fucking happened out of nowhere. Before that, you were all having fun. What are you talking about? Yeah, that's a good point. You know, and whereas this one is like, disappointment is integrated into the story at the core of it because it happens every five minutes. Okay. Something happens that screws him over. Okay. And the movie says like, that's great. You know, like that's that's part of life, and that's. You should learn to be happy with those moments because they expose you to new experiences, lessons to grow up, uh, all of these things, you know. All right. Or, or to new facets of the people you, you knew, you know, like this, there's a, it's a terrible thing when he loses his shit and beats the crap out of the bully. Yeah. It's a sad thing. He's crying his eyes out. He's not proud of himself. He's traumatized by what he just did. But that moment, he learns a new side of his mother that he'd never known before. And that, that's, that's a, one, probably one of the most important lessons he's going to learn in his life about who his mom really is. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's how life is. Hmm. Well, knowing what you guys know, life, if you're in that kind of movie, it's all good. I'm, I'm more of like the fantasy kind of life. I recommend the dog who stopped the war. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> No, especially if you have kids. It's a fun movie. <laughs> like, look, The Dog Who Saw the War is a fine movie, except for the final act. Yeah. It, it's actually really adorable. Yeah. But for me, yeah. between the two, it's like one teaches you a valuable life lesson for real that I that even after seeing the movie, I tend to forget it, which yeah. is to enjoy what you have and to cherish what you have. Whereas The Dog Who Stopped the War, 
teaches me nothing that could be useful in life. Yeah, nothing, but whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. So you were saying, yeah. sorry. No, I was, I was done. I, was, I, I, I didn't like it. So if, you, if you're a curmudgeon like me, you don't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. That's what it comes down to. But like, I'll tell you a movie that you really shouldn't watch is uh, Christmas Story 2. Oh, God, this is bad. Ah. But you wanted more formulaic slapstick. Yeah. So maybe you'll like A Christmas Too, because it's already more formulaic slapstick. Okay. It's five years later, yeah. so uh, Ralphie at this point is a teenager, and what he really, really, really wants uh, for Christmas is a car, like a deluxe car <laughs> thing. But it's a used car. It's a used car. Okay. Wants, so, so. Uh, which is fine, but first of all, there's several problems with that, because he comes off like a selfish prick. Because it's one thing for Ralphie to be a selfish prick uh, as a 10-year-old yeah. and want a BB gun because that's what a 10-year-old is like. It's yeah. kind of cute. It's another for 16-year-old to go like, what I want for Christmas is a car instead of trying to get the car for him. You, you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, yeah. No, I completely understand. It, it, it's not something I can celebrate the same way I can celebrate 10-year-old Ralphie. And so that colors the movie already really wrong. Yeah. You know? And of course, they can't get the same actors, so we have a very different actor for the dad. Uh, we get the actor who was in Home Alone, like the guy, uh, the guy who's not Joe Pesci. Him? Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, and uh, he plays the dad, and he plays it way over the top, slapstick as uh, as a character. Whereas you know the original dad was such a fascinating figure because he's wrong ninety percent of the time in the movie. He's wrong, but he's still charming, and he still comes off as a very intelligent person yeah. who just happens to be wrong in the sections of the movie we see. Yeah, you know. And then they have this plot line where he uncovers the leg lamp. Yeah. And still cherishes it, which makes no sense because five years earlier he cherished it because he had just won it, not yeah. because he thinks it's pretty. Yeah. So it, it's a sequel that doesn't even understand the first movie. Interesting. Uh, so you don't recommend it? Oh, God, no, it's awful. Don't touch that thing. Mm -hmm. I, and if, like, in fact, if you get the combo pack, because I know they sell both of them oh, together. Burn the uh, other one. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. It's like, don't even use it as a coaster because it'll be a reminder of this thing's existence. Did you have high expectations, honestly? No, I didn't. I okay, didn't. I didn't. Good. No, no, it's, 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 it's 30 years after the fact. It's a direct -to video release. It's a movie that doesn't deserve a sequel, to be honest. Like, uh, A Christmas Story ends where it should end, with yeah. Christmas being over. I don't care to know what Ralphie's next Christmas is like, because it'll be exactly like this one. Full of wonder, full of expectations, and full of disappointments, because that's how life is. The first movie made that point very clearly. Any subsequent movie would just be repeating itself, or yeah. betraying the spirit, like this one does. That's true. So it did F with the original. Yeah. All yeah, right. absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. Now let me talk to you about the dog who stopped the war too. Okay. Um, <laughs> 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 All right, then on that note, if you have any questions, comments, you want to share your love or hatred of uh, A Christmas Story, Bob Clark's original. Bob Clark, by the way, mm -hmm. director of A Christmas Story here. Also director of Black Christmas, which maybe we should have reviewed instead, because that has a proper remake. Okay. That is special. <laughs> <laughs> and Porky's. Are you kidding me? I am not kidding you. Wow. All right, so what was I saying? Yes, if you uh, want to share your thoughts about all of this, you can write us at mail at idiomatic.com or post a comment at idiomatic.com. Just click on the episode name. Mm -hmm. We're also on Facebook. We're also on Twitter. We're also on iTunes. If you could write us an uh, iTunes review, this we would be really grateful. Or like us on Facebook and like us on Facebook. We really would appreciate it. It helps us get the support to continue generating content on a regular basis. Otherwise, I will have no choice but to give Nick a BB gun and wait till he shoots his eye out. That's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe these things existed for kids at the time. Like, nothing about it seems like a good idea. No, not at all. <laughs>just for that it's like no this, this up is like way too long and okay i, I see where you're going now but it, you know it, it, too late you know, <laughs> I, I got the joke like 10 minutes before you did it <laughs> well, what i like about this movie is that it's a very cynical christmas movie everybody loves it uh, and i am of these people too and it does have a hopeful spirit about it because it, it is about looking back on your youth and and seeing beauty in a lot of those things but 
It is about seeing beauty in disappointment. The whole entire movie is about these characters facing one disappointment after the other. Okay. They get their spirits lifted up, and then something happens. Like, my favorite one is the Ovaltine joke, because they, he listens to a radio show, yeah. and he sends in his proofs of purchase by buying Ovaltine and gets the decoder. And at the end of the radio show, which is an adventure show, they give a code, and using the decoder, you can get the secret message. And because he's a kid, he's yeah. super excited about it. Mm. And then the message turns out to be so effing lame. You forgot the first rule of remakes, Jill. Don't fuck with the original. Merry Christmas, everyone! Merry Christmas! This is another episode of Don't F with the Original. With Nicholas, I am the VM correspondent for Idiomatic. And I'm Dimitri, editor in chief of Idiomatic.com and movie critic. Now, we were actually supposed to talk about um, The Hunt for Red October. Yeah. Because um, Jack Ryan's Shadow Recruit was slated to come out today. Yeah. But they pushed it back to uh, January 17th, so that's when we'll post that episode. I think it's a good choice. It's a weird Christmas movie, I think. A lot of times when they release it on Christmas, it's because it's either Oscar bait or crap. Oh, I see. <laughs> and since Jack Ryan's Shadow Recruit is not Oscar bait, I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> maybe it's not as crap as they thought, is what you're thinking? Yeah, exactly. Okay, interesting. So, maybe that's the case. So, you know. Give me one, and Santa is like... No, no BB gun, because it's dangerous. You should try out. And then, towards the end, well... Well, no, let's not spoil the end. There, we, well, we can save it for the... Towards spoiler. the end, Christmas happens. Yeah. And, you know, to be continued. Yeah. That's a pretty adequate synopsis for a film that's very hard to summarize. Yeah. Because uh, what it is, it's a slice of life movie. It, really, what it is, is like, it's a couple of days before Christmas, all the way to Christmas, and stuff happens. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. Uh, and one thing that we should mention, though, it takes place around 1939, 1940. So it's a period piece as well. Okay. I was wondering why they weren't watching TV. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I got that. It was. <laughs> uh, and, you know, you can tell it's based on a series of short stories because it's really non sequitur. Like, just random stuff happens all the way to that Christmas. That makes... Now that you tell me this, that actually makes sense. Because, hey, it was a bunch of random stuff and... Some of it, you know, it, it felt like there was very, very long setups for like, okay, a little, little payoff there, and I didn't quite like it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what it is. Like, that's what life is. That's what youth is. It's just a series of disappointments because your imagination is so much wilder than the reality, and you're all constantly hit with the reality. Yeah. And that's what the movie shows us, and that that's the beauty of youth because... As an adult, you look back on it, and what you remember is the sense of wonderment, not the pepper that follows it. Really? Because I do remember all the terrible games that I, I rented at, you know, the video store. That I was like, I was really, really excited. I was like, oh, it's going to be a great game. And then you're like, dud. <laughs> I remember playing Ghostbusters. Well, like, no, but like if you had kids, yeah. would you celebrate Christmas with them? Probably. Yeah. When, objectively speaking, how many of your Christmases were good and how many of them involved getting sweaters you don't give a shit about? Oh, okay. I can see what you're, you know, I can see what you're getting, yeah. yeah. I, you remember the good gifts. Like, I can't really remember the, the bad stuff. Yeah. But I do remember getting some bad stuff, not specifically, but, you know, my mother layered it with the good stuff. So, you know, it was mostly, you know... I was like, oh, no, what are we going to talk about uh, uh, today in that case? Because, you know, there's like... Uh, I don't believe there's a movie called 46 Ronin that we can review. Mm. Um, but and then I was at Walmart and I saw in like the bargain bin a movie called A Christmas Story Part 2. 1983 is the original A Christmas Story by Bob Clark. Wow. So I was like, what the heck is that? And so I found out that it actually just came out last year, 2012. A Christmas movie. And I thought like, you know what? Since there was a sequel about it slash revival at this point, you know, it's like 30 years later. Let's talk about the original. Let's talk about Bob Clark's Christmas Story, a movie that everyone loves. Not me. Why do you hate Christmas? Well, the story is that Ralphie wa really wants a BB gun for Christmas. Um, so he tries to, you know, give the hints to his family that he wants a BB gun, and he's like, no, you're going to shoot your eye out. So then he plots, maybe, you know, in school, maybe when he writes his essay, what I want for Christmas, maybe he'll write it so good that his teacher is going to tell his parents, and... Again, no. Then he's maybe I'll get Santa to 